Welcome to the Jill on Money Show. It's Friday, April 12th, and we are here trying to help you make better financial decisions or just make uh, more informed choices. Sometimes it's not a big decision, one thing versus another. It's just understanding what your options are. So if you'd like a better understanding of those options, then we encourage you to go to our website. That's jillonmoney.com. While you're there, you can click the Contact Us button in the upper right-hand corner and complete a note. Now, if you would like to come on the air, you can kind of go sparse on the details. But if you're really nervous about coming on the air, give us lots of details. I, I certainly don't have to read every single detail, but it does give us a better understanding about what's going on. While you are on the website, please sign up for our free weekly newsletter. It comes out today, every Friday. Mark does such a great job with that. And also, our subscription service, Jill on Money Live. That is our subscription service. And, you know, that is so much fun because we do webinars. We also have video interviews. And our most recent interview is with a uh, professor, labor economist, and author, Teresa Ghilarducci. Mostly Mark and I like having her on over and over because we love saying her last name. Now, she's great. She's got a new book out. It's called Work, Retire, Repeat. And the subtitle, I think it'll catch your uh, attention, The Uncertainty of Retirement in the New Economy. I love Teresa, but you can only check out that interview if if you subscribe to Jill on Money Live. And for 35 bucks, you get to watch that interview, interviews with people like Kathy Jones, who's the Bond Queen from Schwab. And also you get those webinars, the most recent one we had with Cal Newport. The interview is so great and I love him. I just adore him. So you can only get all that awesome content if you join Jill on Money Live for 35 bucks not so bad for a full year. It's pretty good. All right, let's do some emails. This is from Judy, who wants to know about financing her next home. And she said, I am moving next to my son and daughter-in-law. And here's Judy's plan. She wants to buy a tiny home and put it on their side lot. She says, I'll need to sell my house, which I've lived in for over 40 years. I don't have the cash to purchase the next home until I sell the current one. I need to pay for part of the next home before selling the current one. What are my options? These are always very interesting issues because what you really want to do is sort of say, I want to sort of tap the equity of my current home, but then it's annoying to actually take a loan for such a short period of time. So is it possible? I know this sounds crazy, but is it possible that your son and daughter-in-law can float it? Can they pay for the beginning part of the construction or um, have maybe a bank where they can back up the um, the loan to you that make it almost like a personal loan or a bridge loan? I'd go to a bank. I'd tell them the situation and see if we can come up with a solution because it seems like there should be a solution. And hopefully it'll be one that I think that you can manage. It really depends on the amount of money you really do need. So um, those are just a few ideas. A lot of banks will do that, especially credit unions. They might be able to do that. All right, this is from Asha. Guess what? Mark, it, it's like the 8,000 millionth time that we have a subject line that says, can I retire early? <laughs> but we know you guys love those shows. Those are the most downloaded shows. Okay, so Asha says, like many Americans, I worry about my ability to fund retirement. Okay, so here's what we got. I want to leave my corporate role and I want to focus on pursuits that likely won't generate any income. Those are not, those are called hobbies, I think. I'm a longtime listener fan and know that you would give me your honest and Jill assessment of my situation. Mm, honesty is good. All right, Mark, you'll love this. Current age, 52. Target retirement age, 53. Okay, we want to retire in a year. Let's look at this. I live in California, so let's just um, give you that background. Current salary is 200 grand. Monthly expense is $6,500, 90 grand in an emergency reserve fund, 401k, 900,000. Uh, IRA, I, I'm pre, I presume that the 401k is pre-tax because this is how it's listed out. IRA pre-tax, 300,000. Roth, 725. Whoo! And a brokerage account with $1.2 million. Okay, so California, we rent in California. And Asha owns rental property in D.C. that breaks even. It's worth about four fifty. It has a two hundred thousand dollar mortgage. Okay, I plan to move back into it for two years before I sell it. 
in the future for tax purposes. <laughs> These people are so nuts with taxes. I love it. I'm single, no kids, an overweight cat. <laughs> Okay, based on calculations, uh, I'll get $3,700 in future Social Security at my full retirement age, which is 67. Can I pull off leaving paid work in a year? Ay, ay, ay. All right, let's just look at this for a second. So I have a brokerage account of $1.2 million, and um, I'm going to have to live on that, right? So we got to pull out ninety grand a year. Let's say it's ninety a year from that, okay? From 52 to 59 and a half, right? Let's think about how we can manage this. Mark and I were just having a quick conversation where Mark's like, well, maybe Asha can work for a few more years till age 55 and then we can invoke the rule of 55. But I always feel like when someone says I'm 52 and I want to retire next year, they're not making it to 55. But let's just see if we can do it based on next year. Here's what I'm thinking. From let's say 53 to 59, for those six years, we pull out a hundred grand a year from the brokerage account for six years, right? So it'll be a little bit more because it'll be inflated, right, gang? So let's say that of the 1.2, by the time we get to age 59, you know, we've pulled out 700 grand. So now we have a half a million dollars left. All right. Now, the 401k, we continue to let that grow and the traditional IRA. And then from 59 to 67, we pull the money out of there. And now we've basically got you to age 67. Now you've, and maybe even, I don't know about your health, but maybe we even go to 70. And we kind of pull all the money out of that 401k over those next seven, eight years, probably be probably going to drain most of it, which leaves us with Mark. We'll have like a half a million. Again, this is totally back of the envelope. This is not high math gang. Let's say that we have about a half a million dollars at age 67 in the brokerage account. And then at the, in the 401k, we've, you know, essentially drained most. So let's pretend the whole 401k is gone. And then we have an IRA that's worth Three, well, give me 300,000 um, for 14 years, Mark. Let's say it's probably uh, six. Uh, about 700. 700 in there. I think it's doable. Here's the thing. I think it works so much better, as Mark was saying to me off air, it works better if you work longer, right? If you work till age 55, then you can invoke this thing called the rule of 55. And essentially what happens with the rule of 55 is that you keep working and then you can take distributions from your 401k without paying the early withdrawal penalty. Now you have to pay taxes on it, but you don't have to have any, there, there is no uh, penalty for being pre 59 and a half. Okay. May help deplete that required minimum distribution down the line also. Although, listen, by retiring so early, I think what happens is that, you know, you're going to blow through a lot of this. But you're single and it's your prerogative. Single with no kids, except you got to just keep feeding that fat cat. The numbers will look good based on your game plan, but you'll have more options if you wait till 55. Uh, this is from Peggy, who says she enjoys my columns in the Chicago Tribune. And the question is, my mother passed away in 2018. I still have her income tax papers from 17, 2017 and 2018. Is it necessary to keep these? Mark, I had to look this up because we got another question about estate documents. So as we reminded everybody that what you need to keep and what you need to shred, we go back six years for the IRS, right? So we just had 23, 22, 21, 20, 19, 18. So you can definitely shred 2017. I did learn after researching this that for estate documents and estate tax returns, three years. You could go to six, but it's really three years that you need. So I hope that helps, Peggy. Uh, this is from Patrick. Uh, financial advice on retirement for a complicated next couple of years. Good morning, Jill. I love the show. I was hoping you could provide some financial advice. I'm currently deployed and I can't come on the show for security reasons. Woo, Mark. Mm, I love that. Okay. You know, we love our military folks. So thank you for listening. You guys are awesome. And gals. Uh, okay. Let's see. 
current situation is Patrick's 31, married, has a toddler. Wife is a nurse, earns 50 grand working part time. Got 30 grand in savings, 125 grand in a brokerage account, all stocks, mostly S&P 500 and mostly ETFs. Thrift savings plan has 200 grand. Uh, she's got 20 grand she, in a savings account, about 37 in a traditional IRA, 13 in a Roth and 92,000 in stocks. Listen to this. Uh, they've got a mortgage at two and a quarter percent. Oh my God. They're going to rent this house out in the future. Okay. Here's the current financial plan. We like to max my thrift savings plan through combat zone entitlements which enabled me to contribute $23,000 to my Roth and $46,000 to my traditional tax-free. Mark, have you ever heard of that? Combat zone entitlements? That's a first. I've never heard of that. Yeah, I've never heard of it, but uh, good That's, for him. He and thank God, it. I was just going to say, it should be like 169000 as far as I'm concerned. Okay. Uh, they're going to liquidate his stock portfolio at the end of the year to avoid capital gains as my taxable income should be below the minimum threshold. Brilliant. With that being said, is there anything else I should be aware of when considering completing our taxes jointly or separately? Oh, interesting. Okay. What I have done and I when before I got married, I had my accountant run a dummy return for me both both ways. What I can tell you is it very rarely makes sense to file separately. In your case, it may though. And if she were to, let's just think about it. If she were, if she were to file separately, there's two questions. One is who claims the toddler for tax purposes? And does that mess with any potential benefits you get for that toddler going forward, like GI Bill? And also like just plain old dollars. So I think you have to just run it both ways. You can have an accountant do that. Here's the next part of this. I plan to exit the military next August and go into an MBA program. I will be earning zero income for the first year of my MBA, but the program should be free minus lost income with a housing stipend through the GI Bill. Ideally, during the second year, I'll have a paid internship. It should release some, relieve some pressure on us, and then I hope we're off to the races. Anything you would recommend we do money-wise prior to when I exit the military next August? Well, here's two things to consider. So you're going to – I don't know if you can really live on your wife's salary, but when you liquidate your stocks, right, what I would do is keep more money in cash than you normally would. And then I might consider for that second year when – that so you're going to be contributing all this money to the retirement account now you liquidate your stock at the end of this year you're going to avoid your capital gains then next year for the i think that maybe in january of 26 we should look at whether you um should liquidate some of your wife's brokerage because she too is going to be in a low bracket right so if you if you file jointly in 26 right and all you're doing is having her earn 50, 60 grand, then you're in this category where you could sell everything in her account, pay no taxes and start over. And what's really nice about that is that you're starting with a new cost basis. But I think besides freeing up money and then avoiding capital gains in both of those accounts, just make sure when, if she has a choice in terms of retirement contributions, that obviously we want you guys being all Roth all the time. Besides that, I just I, this amazing game plan, and you thank you for teaching us about something we didn't know: combat zone entitlements. Did you look that up, Mark, while I was talking? <laughs> I did not. I did not. But they're entitled to everything they get. Oh my God! All right, last question of the day from Lisette, who wants to talk about paying for college. I've been a listener for years, and your podcast has been a great source of information and guidance. It's made my commute bearable since returning to work after the quarantine. So thank you, all caps, Mark, all caps, baby. We're reaching out today to check in to make sure we're doing everything possible to put our family on solid financial footing now and into the future. So, okay, Lisette's fifty-four. She makes one hundred fifty-six grand a year. She's got money in TIAA CREF over three hundred grand, and then she's got about six fifty in a Vanguard IRA, and seventy three in a Vanguard Roth. So just remember fifty four. Okay, Mark, that's important. Spouse sixty one. Oh boy, here we go. New York State uh, pensioner. Awesome. Has a bunch of money in retirement, but they got young kids. Mark, 
They've got a 16-year-old who's got a 529 through New York, 55 grand. They've got a 14-year-old who's got a $45,000 balance. Um, okay. They got life insurance. They own a home. It's 625 ba- value. Balance of a mortgage is about 300 grand at 3%. Okay. They have prepared their wills and their health care proxies. Okay. Monthly expenses, 14 grand. We anticipate our monthly costs to drop um, when they retire. They're going to relocate to a place with a lower cost of living. Their pressing concern is college. We're hoping for merit aid in the private public colleges. They have, all right, so we have admission in the fall of 25. There will be a significant cost after looking at the calculators. Their, their basic question is, should they scale back retirement and put more money in the 529? I mean, their retirement should be fine. Right. I mean, the, let's just go. Let's get college off the table for one second. Let's just look at this retirement. She's 54. Is she going to get a pension? Because I see that she's a state employee, but she doesn't talk about her. She has Social Security. She doesn't talk about her own pension. But I think she gets a pension, man. They don't have a retirement problem. I do think that you can pull back a little bit. You're used to paying some money out of cash flow. You can use some of the money that you've saved, which is fine. I mean, you don't have to go crazy. It doesn't look like you have um, a ton of non-retirement assets. So really that's, you know, they have a, um, they have like a 12 grand in a money market and 30 grand is just a cash value of a whole life policy. So it doesn't look like they have a ton of non-retirement assets. But that said, what I would be clear about is if you reduce that, that's fine. I don't know if you can like pay for a, a a full-blown private university education, right? You're paying 14 grand per kid right now for Catholic school. I just don't know if they're going to be able to do private. What do you think, Mark? Uh, given their current levels, probably not. The so, kids, you know, the kids, it's not like they're four and five. They're, you know, they're getting close to college age. Yeah. She says that um, they think they're going to have to have like 25 to 35 grand a year for kid one. Maybe maybe 30 or 40. I mean, I think they can do it. I just don't know it's going to be so pleasant. And by the way, the time kid two is at the end of kid two, you can pull money out of your retirement and, and you know, because then you're going to be 59 and a half. And, and I presume that when we look at some of the money that is saved, I, I don't know if your spouse has any, that, that 301,000 right? That's in his retirement or her retirement. I don't know if that's a spouse, a boy or a girl. We could use some of that right now. You can pull some of that money out and taxable income, um, or you can do that at the end of the second kid's college. I think they can do it. I'm going to say pull back. Let's go to like, so she's putting 14% in. I would pull that back. This, I would say for your 401, stay at 6%. And for your 457, I would like literally pull it back to 4% and put that extra 10% into the 529 accounts. All right. If you have a question, well, just go to jillonmoney.com. We're happy to talk to you, run your situation by us, et cetera, et cetera. All that has to happen with you being the person who does the out bound reach to us. So jillonmoney.com, click the contact us button. We'll get your note. We'll get you on the air. And we'd like to remind you that you can subscribe to this program on the Odyssey app or wherever you find your favorite podcast. Don't forget to leave us a rating and review. Our music is composed by Joel Goodman. Mark Talercio is our executive producer and king of all things web. And we are distributed by Odyssey. Hey, Mark, I just read an article in the New York Times which says hugs are good for you. That's what scientists say. So um, do me a favor. Put your hands on someone's back. Give someone a hug, either metaphorically, but you know this article says, again, you have to be careful. Make sure that someone wants to be hugged. It does say that uh, physical touch is very important to human beings. See, I always knew being a hugger would be good in my, my, for my overall wellness. Change your work, change your wealth, change your life. Thank you for listening. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Tomorrow.